Everybody. Welcome to the first annual Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Woohoo! Okay, I just hold up fingers. How many countries are we in? Or do you have to take off your shoes? It's a lot. Uh, I am Katherine Campbell. As many of you know, I am the North American Director for the Usability Professionals Association and the acting president of our Los Angeles chapter. And I am half of the uh, co-hosting team tonight, along with the PHP meetup of Los Angeles. And we are super duper excited to see all of you here and to hear the amazing speakers that we have planned this evening. Uh, God must believe in accessibility and inclusive design because two weeks ago, I got an email from Crystal Ehrlich, and those of you who know Crystal know she's a force of nature, and she said, Catherine, there's this really fabulous guy in this really fabulous event, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, and they had great speakers, and Yahoo's a sponsor, and we need your help to pull this all together and get the word out. And I said, two weeks from, from today, <laughs> right? You're kidding me, right? And somehow, it just, came together, and I can't believe it because usually we spend four or five months pulling these things together, um, especially for the caliber of speaker that we have tonight. So very, very excited that it did come together and that all of you are going to be able to join us uh, for this experience. Um, I have a couple of obligatory call shout outs for the UPA, the Usability Professionals Association. One is, uh, anybody here already signed up to go to the annual conference in June in Las Vegas? few of you. Um, the, the bad news is that as of Tuesday, the rates went up to regular registration, so you no longer get the discount. The good news is it is still a heck of a bargain. The annual conference is three and a half days of some of the largest companies in the world, the most sophisticated usability um, programs and technologies and methodologies and information. And they um, also talk about how to make uh, use of those techniques and methodologies in everything all the way down to the smallest startup. If you have not yet looked at it, go to the Usability Professionals Association site, look at the um, June 3rd through 8th uh, conference, I'm sorry, 5th through 8th. It's in Vegas, so I will help you find a carpool buddy, and you can go on the cheap, and you can go for one or two days, but take a look at it, it's really a great deal. If you can't make it, a poor second choice but still one to consider is two weeks later, uh, UPA LA is going to be putting together a debrief on the conference and we'll be highlighting some of the top uh, presentations that we see. So um, Mickey, thank you up there at the front desk is Mickey Way, our treasurer, and he and I are going to be working on that event. It will get posted on the LA UPA meetup as soon as this event is over and we finish with all the great accolades and reviews. Um, all right, on to our thank yous. I wanted to thank uh, Dan Malka over here uh, and Yahoo, who really stepped up to the plate. They had already volunteered to be sponsors, but we moved this from a smaller venue to this venue. They've provided all the food. They've provided the transportation expenses for the speakers. Um, just been a phenomenal sponsor and really went above and beyond the call of duty. And now I would like to turn it over to the, um, the real hosts this evening, uh, Joe Devon and Jenison Asunsen, uh, who basically were the creators of today and tell you a little bit about their inspiration and they can introduce our evening speakers. Thanks. copies of Steve Sauter's original book, for those of you who know anything about uh, performance, uh, he's the guru, uh, and two copies of his second book. So if you could just take one, uh, the bottom, you can see the, the top ticket, and then the other one, we're going to do a raffle at the end. 
Uh, Jenison, are you on? I am. Can everyone hear me? Oh. Yeah. 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 Sound like you're in the back of the room. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we can hear you. Yeah, is that any better? I can... it, it, it's great for being in Toronto. <laughs> I want to first say, uh, Catherine, how can I get on that, that trip to Vegas? I'll work with you. <laughs> I, I just wanted to, to really quickly say uh, hello to everyone uh, here in Toronto. Uh, if you're tweeting, if you're on your mobile devices, the hashtag for the event is God, hashtag G A A D. <laughs> And really, I guess I just want to, if, if I could, just really say thanks to everyone who's attended. We've had people running events from Australia all the way here to Toronto. Uh, and, and we've got people signing up already for next year uh, to do some great stuff. So um, I, I'll keep my comments brief. I, I would want to just tell you how, from my perspective, this all started. Back last November, uh, Joe wrote a blog post mentioning how good it would be and how important it is for developers to have some basic knowledge of accessibility and how it's a, it would be good to have a day, uh, maybe at night, to have a global accessibility awareness day. So because of some of my other involvements and, and the fact that I work in the accessibility space, uh, I, I happened to be home, it was a random Saturday evening that I was home, and thanks to Twitter I saw that Joe blog, uh, blogged this, and uh, was in touch with him almost immediately, and uh, we basically picked this up, and fast forward, uh, like I said, we've had uh, events in uh, Melbourne, and Brisbane, and Sydney, Australia, in Mumbai, in India, in Wales, in the UK, uh, and we just wrapped some stuff up in Toronto and Boston and uh, we're finishing some events up in LA and San Diego. So you are all part of a, an international movement. It, it, it's so important, I mean the real goal of this day is to just get people thinking, talking and experiencing digital accessibility. So digital accessibility being whether it's web, mobile, or, or, or a kiosk, something. And, and when we're talking about people with disabilities, we're talking about everything. People who are blind, who have low vision, who, who have mobility impairments, who are deaf, uh, people with, with cognitive disabilities, it's the whole gambit. So on our website, which is uh, www.globalaccessibilityawareness.org, we invited people all day, we continue to invite people to really just experience things. So, I'll plug your mouse for an hour, do things like that. Um, and based on the hashtag, which is GAAD, uh, people have been doing all kinds of stuff. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm hoping I'm able to stay on to listen, but I'm gonna really turn things over back to Joe. I want to thank the folks at Yahoo, my, my really good friend, and, and a really giant in accessibility, Victor Sauron, and, and another friend of mine, uh, Todd Klutz, you're in well, you're in great hands there. I'm glad I was able to Skype in to say hello. Uh, I can't believe uh, that we were able to, to really put, put this together and, and with, with Catherine, with you and Crystal and everyone just at, at the, you know, just people came together and understood that this was important and that it mattered. Can you hear me? Uh, I, yeah. Can you hear me? That's because we have a force of nature by the name of Jenison that has really made this happen. <laughs> the only reason. So I, I'm going to close my comment. I'm going to close now and just listen in. But I just, you all need to, to continue those applause to Joe because Joe just, he had, a, he had an idea. And I don't think he thought he would get this, this global lots idea. Of ideas, but this, this, uh, <laughs> there's not too many Jenisons around, so. Uh, <laughs> this is all, this is all uh, thanks to, uh, to, to him for inspiring the idea. But I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm going to close now because you've got some amazing speakers to come. I just want to thank everyone for, for being there. If I could put a plug in, because Joe kind of, he, he bought into more than he bargained for. Because uh, on October 17th, I will be in Los Angeles to co-lead the first Accessibility Camp Los Angeles. So everyone here uh, we, will meet the man. <laughs> we, we, 
We've had accessibility camps in Washington, D.C. and in Boston, um, and here in Toronto and Montreal, and, and we've had sister events elsewhere. But I'm looking forward, this is really an excuse for me to come to L.A., but, but um, I hope to, to, to meet each of you there at Accessibility Camp Los Angeles and more to come. I'm going to turn things back over to, uh, to Joe. Uh, with my thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just going to say a couple of words before I, I turn it over. Uh, the way that this really started is that Victor here, who's going to speak in a moment, uh, made a little video. I think it was even before YouTube's time. It was a, a Yahoo video uh, where he basically showed what it's like to uh, surf the web uh, if you can't see it. And so it was using a screen reader, and it just really blew me away because we don't think about these things uh, if, we're, if you're sighted, you know. So, so basically, like when you're going to a CNN page, you, you've got like all kind of headlines all over the place, and if you're sighted instantly, you just know exactly where to look and where to click. But if you're not, you have to listen. Like imagine you have no screen in front of you. It just really blew me away as somebody that builds web pages. Uh, you know, that, that we really need to make things a little bit easier for everyone to use. Uh, and so this was just something that sat in the back of my brain for a long time. And then um, my father, who is now 87, uh, is dealing with banks. He, he doesn't hear very well. When he calls up, he can't really speak to the banks. And so the web would be a wonderful thing. You would think that banking would really be on top of all this. But I customized the browser so that uh, he has the high contract and you can see and you have Google, like if you try to go to Gmail and certain websites, they'll cross out the, the text. They'll do all kind of funky things, and he, he has a very difficult time surfing the web. Um, so then I just wrote this little blog post thinking that everybody would ignore it, and of course Jenison, uh, you know, did it, and he told me, hey, you gotta do this. I just picked a day, you know, said, let's do May 9th, what the hell. Uh, and neither of us had any time, but we just said, all right, let's go forward with it, and make it happen and whatever it is, it is, and this has just really been unbelievable. Uh, we've had, uh, we've had uh, press in Canada and uh, just a worldwide outpouring. Twitter has been, has been really amazing. Um, so let me see, I think we're about ready to get started. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Todd Kutz, um, he's a uh, uh, Yahoo dude. Bio, I didn't get any bio ahead of time, so. Yeah, I should have just Okay, sorry about that. Um, everyone hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, as Joe said, my name is Todd Kloots. I work at Yahoo. I'm part of uh, Yahoo's accessibility team. So, I work alongside uh, Victor Sarin. Victor has really been um, the person who introduced me to the field of accessibility and has been sort of my mentor in this field and how I've learned so much of what I've learned already. Um, so, uh, my talk today is going to be focused on what I call the audio only user experience. And this is going to be particularly about um, how users who use, use screen readers um, access the web. Um, and just wanted to get a, a, a sense of the audience. How many of you are developers? Okay, cool, so half. And then are, is everyone else a designer or a usability professional, researcher? Is that sound about right? Okay. So tonight's talk, I'm going to try to keep um, fairly light on code, although I will talk about code a little bit, but just to sort of set expectations. We're going to be talking a large amount about how screeners work, uh, give you a sense of the problem space, because in my uh, teaching of developers and designers, what I've often found is that people are super smart, often way, way smarter than I am, and to give people a sense of sort of essentially what the fundamental problem is, people can then sort of take it there, fr from there rather, learn on their own and continue to grow and sort of design solutions um, sort of out of their own. Um, ideas as opposed to me telling them, oh, this is the exact solution for the problem. So it's actually about sort of helping you sort of uh, understand, the, understand the problem that users um, of screeners face when they're browsing the web. So um, without further ado, I'll get started here. Um, so yeah, the goals tonight are, are really these. Teach you the fundamentals of how screeners work. Um, teach you some fundamentals about how to improve the user experience for users of screeners. And then third, really, it, most importantly, inspire you to learn more, to um, use a screen reader that's already installed on your Mac, if you're a Mac user, to download 
a screener to your uh, PC or, or Linux machine if you if that's um, your operating system of choice, um, so that you can sort of again continue uh, to to learn, experiment, and to invent new solutions for the web. Um, all right, so screeners, what are they? The name sort of implies that they read the screen, although as it pertains to web-based content, really screen readers sort of harvest the HTML as sort of the source of the information that they give the user. Um, and the way that they um, actually end up deciding what to speak and when to speak is they read the element that is currently focused. And so as the user is moving the focus cursor through the page, that is the element that will get announced to the user. Uh, and typically, what screen readers do is they give users um, any number of uh, the following pieces of information. First of all, what type of element are you on so that the user sort of has some sort of context? Are you on a heading? Are you on a list? Are you inside a button, a text field, etc.? So you need to know the, the control type that you're in so you know, you know what the abilities of the thing that you're on are. Um, if it has any sort of label text associated with it that can help you differentiate one element from another, like if you're in a text field, am I supposed to enter my first name, my last name, my phone number, so it will announce the corresponding label text. Um, if that control has any sort of state associated with it, like a radio button can be checked or unchecked, a screener will also announce that state information. Um, and then sometimes they'll go and try to give the user uh, a sense of overarching context. So, you know, what part of the form are you on? Are you supposed to be entering, you know, work-related information here or personal-related information? Um, so that's um, at a high level. Um, what information is announced? Um, when and how? Um, so this is some very sort of basic overview of uh, how screeners work for the web. Um, so that's what they um, that's what they are and what they do. So how does a user um, who is using a screener actually navigate through web-based content? So um, I'll I'll sort of start with how you know we as sighted users approach the problem. So you know I think Joe sort of alluded to this in the intro. You know as a sighted person, I look at for example Yahoo News, and if I want to focus on what we call uh, the jumbotron here and read some of these top headlines, I'll literally just you know focus my eyes there, and my eyes sort of give me the ability to blur out the surrounding content. I'll just focus in, read those headlines, and so I start out with the gestalt. I see everything, and then I I focus in. Um, well, the screen reader user experience is actually very much the opposite of that because you start with an empty canvas, right? And so if I'm reading Yahoo News with the screen reader, I'm going to start at the top of the page and sort of move linearly from top to bottom and try to get a sense of what's going on. So I'll start out with a blank canvas and then I'll hit, okay, oh, hi Todd, sign out link, a help link, hit Yahoo on my homepage, I'll reach this little bell that hopefully has some alternative text attached to it so it'll read notifications, something about mail, something about my Yahoo, a link to Yahoo's homepage, then I'll hear something about the Yahoo News logo, hit the search box, but I'm experiencing these elements one at a time, right? So it's sort of like uh, following a breadcrumb trail. And it's not until I traverse that path that as a user I can sort of start to build a mental model of where I've been and sort of get a sense of the, the scope. Um, and so in, as a sighted person, you might think that you know, after traversing that path, I might have an image in my head as a blind user, something similar to what's on the screen here. But you know, in speaking with uh, Victor, uh, my colleague, he said, it's, you know, it's actually a little bit more like this. Imagine just a linear um, set of you know, text that's just you know, space separated, and that's sort of what you have to work with as a screener user as you're building this mental model in your head. It's just you know, it's one big long line of text. You're trying to differentiate you know, how things sort of fit together. And so that's, I would say, a closer visualization of the mental model that the screener user has for a given piece of web content. It's also interesting to note that to give you a sense of what this experience is like from an audio basis, uh, I'll play you sort of the speed at which a user of a screen reader typically would listen to a page as it's being announced by the screen reader. So it goes by pretty blazingly fast, right? And, and it, that's very much of necessity because, especially, you know, our sites are so content rich that if you're, you know, used to listening to audio, you just become really, really um, uh, adept at doing that at that speed, and that's how you can be proficient. Otherwise, going through any given page would take a really, really long time. Um, it's also important to note that, and this may seem obvious to some people, it may not be obvious to others, is that. When you're using a screen reader uh, as a user who is blind, the 
mouse is a useless tool. X and Y sort of don't make any sense. So the keyboard is both your primary navigational mechanism as well as your primary means of user input. So it's all about the keyboard. The, the mouse is, is not used. Um, and so to give you a little bit more detail on how screen readers work and enable the users to actually access the content on the page, they really provide two navigational modes for the user. One, which I'm going to call generically focus mode. Different screen readers call this mode different things. Um, and another called virtual mode. Um, so to give you a sense of what these two modes are, I'll give you a, a quick um, explanation. So in focus mode, it's very similar to what you and I would use uh, as sighted people when we're browsing the web, even if we were just using a keyboard, where we'd use the tab key to move the uh, focus cursor forward to the page, and you'd press shift tab to move, to move the cursor and reverse work to the page. And as I'm moving the cursor, then the streamer will speak the text that's on the screen. So I'll move over to um, the Windows side here to give you a very quick demo of this. So, hey, who? News, latest news, and headlines. So Document. Search. search, edit. Let's start at the top of the page. We're in the search box. I'll just keep pressing tab. List. Out of list. Quick mobile navigation. Landmark list with 13 items. Home visited. Link. Hey, who? News, latest news, and list with 12 items, video link, photos link, GN mailing. And essentially, you link. that's how focus mode uh, works. As I press the tab key, I'm going to move focus to a new element on the page. The screener is going to announce that element, and then I can keep going. Um, there are, of course, limitations to this mode, um, which are probably uh, seem somewhat obvious, which is it's kind of slow, right? And you have to go in linear top to bottom order. Um, but also, most importantly, not every element is focusable. I mean, there's a lot of just plain text on a page. Think about any you know, news article that's just you know, paragraph after paragraph of text. That's not focusable content, which means if you're relying on the tab key, which is just limiting you to focusable elements, you're not going to be able to have access to that text. And so the way um, this is solved by screen readers is through this virtual navigation mode. And what this does essentially is map um, keyboard uh, shortcuts to different HTML element types. So, you know, semantic HTML provides you with different tags to represent different types of content. So headings can be represented with the various um, heading level tags, H1 through H6, paragraphs as uh, the P tag, the various list tags, table tags, etc. And what screeners do in this virtual mode is give you keyboard mnemonics that map to those element types. So you can press the H key, for example, to go between all the headings on the page, the I key to go between all the list items on the page, or um, T to go between tables, G to go between um, graphics or images. And this allows you to not only access all the elements on the page, but you can access them a lot faster because you don't have to necessarily go in the exact DOM order. You can you know, press H and just skip, skip around um, quicker to the page. You get a, 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 an easier sense or summary of what's going on. Um, so I'll give you a, a short demo of that as well. So here I am back on Yahoo News. Out of list, out of list, main landmark, who? News heading, level one. So now I'm on the first level heading. And How will balance change of heart affect his re-election campaign? Link heading level about the couple of Level two. Yemen, all Kiev and hotbed forge error one hundred one link heading level two. News for you had featured heading level three. So that's sort of again the basics of uh, how the virtual mode works. And again, this is all made possible because of the semantics of HTML. The the, the more semantic the markup is. That's how the screeners are able to, um, to make this possible. So it's only through that common language that, that the web shares that you know, screeners are actually able to implement this functionality. If the web was a wild, wild west of different tags and everyone implemented content differently, you know, there would be no single language that screeners could depend on and say, you know, I know that this uh, page is going to contain some headlines and some links, and therefore I can um, access those elements um, reliably and provide keyboard shortcuts for the user to be able to access that content. And not only that, but be able to tell the user exactly what the content type is. And so it is through this normalization that this experience is made possible. Um, okay, so that all sounds good. So what could possibly go wrong, right? As it turns out, many things can go wrong. Um, so a very simple 
thing is, is that although the although HTML provides all these you know semantic elements that you can take advantage of as a developer or as a designer, you don't have to use those, right? The web is a very um, mutable um, pro programming environment, and you can build things that have the visual style or um, the behavior you want from the perspective of the mouse, and have the underlying code that is used to represent or build that control not be semantic whatsoever. As a very simple example of that, I've created this page which has three buttons. They all look identical, but they're built out of three different types of HTML. The first is a simple span element, which is a structural element that has no semantic meaning at all. The second is another common implementation of a button, which is a link that has um, its href set to a, just a simple hash. And then thirdly, there is a button tag that's used to, to build the button, right? So three different approaches, they all look visually, but what's the audio experience of each of these like? So I'll play you the difference in how these elements sound versus how you know we actually experience them visually. Window, Safari, Toolbar, Example, Settings. Internal link, Settings. Settings button. Okay, so the first one is just a label announced, Settings. And it's also worth pointing out that because it's a span, it's not going to be in the tab flow, which means that element itself is keyboard inaccessible, which means a user of a streamer would unlikely be able to access that element easily and probably have to go to the virtual navigation just to access that button. Um, and in the second example, you know, the streamer, the audio experience was linked, even though the user might be looking for a button. And then the third, of course, is where we have this um, as much parity as possible between the audio user experience and the visual experience. We see a button, and in, thir and in the third example, the screener actually announced button and then um, said settings. And so this is, what, this is sort of where it all comes together, which is that most of the problems for users who rely completely on audio, uh, the problems uh, arise when there is a significant or um, small gap between the user experience for uh, the visual experience and the audio ex experience. Um, and these, these gaps can be small, like what we saw in that initial example, or they can be large. Like there are lots of sites, um, for example, um, Gmail uses a, a lot of structural markup to build their user interface. Um, so does, for example, Apple's, um, a, a lot of their, their sort of web-based suite of tools that sort of follow their desktop version of their applications do this as well, where they have, they've built these very sophisticated um, toolkits for the web that can mimic um, UIs um, that were, are familiar on the desktop in the browser, but that has often come at the cost of sacrificing semantics under the hood. Now, this is not to say that Google uh, Google's mail product isn't inaccessible, but what it does um, result in when you take this development approach is that a lot of the functionality that I showed you earlier that you get for free because of the semantics of the markup is lost. So to show you a, a simple example of that, if I go to Gmail and I'm in Inbox by Todd. my um, streamer on um, Windows, which is in this case NVDA, and I try to use any of those shortcut keys that might be an obvious ex exploration mechanism for me, like I was saying, like to find the different headings on the page or to see if this page contains any links. So I'll press the L key because it looks like you know this left navigation is a list of links. So a user of a streamer might expect that you know there's going to be a list of navigational links on any given page, and that might be their first sort of mechanism that they might go to when they go to a page that they're unfamiliar with. Is I'm going to see if this page contains any headings or if it contains any links. So in the case of Gmail, I'll press L. Clickable list. So we get one clickable no list. No mixed list. Navigation landmark list with four out of list list with 11 items link. No previous list. So we get some lists, but it's again not sort of as robust as possible. So those are some examples of where you have this sort of disparity between the, the visual experience and the audio experience. Um, and, and, and how that choice and markup can actually make that experience better or worse. Um, but there are some times where, as a developer, you do actually the best job possible. You actually use like the, the perfect markup. And even in, the, in some cases, then there is still a gap in the visual and audio user experience. So I'll show you an example of that. So this is going to be me filling out the Yahoo you know, registration form to sign up for a new Yahoo account with the stream reader. And I'm just going to play you the audio of it, just sort of take it in, listen to it, and um, along the way, an, an error is actually going to occur that we're not going to be aware of just through the audio experience. So I'll play that for you. 
First name name required edit text. T D, -D. T last name required edit text. K L O O T S. Select one. Gender pop up button. Menu free items shipped mail. Closing menu. Mail. Select month. Select month. Birthday pop up button. Menu thirteen items check mark. Select November. Closing menu. Day birthday required edit text. Zero year birthday required edit text. Nine five. United States country pop up button English language pop up button postal code edit text nine four nine one seven nine Yahoo ID and email select an ID and password required edit text. Okay, so I filled out a good bit of that form. Um, one error did happen, but it wasn't sort of announced through audio. And here's a screen capture of what the error was. I entered an invalid zip code, and the code used to represent this is actually like really good structural HTML. So. I, you know, the form field is properly labeled, um, and there's a paragraph that, you know, the error message is wrapped in, and it's placed, you know, directly next to the zip code field. But the reason why that error wasn't announced goes back to some of the fundamentals of how screeners work, which I talked to, uh, talked to you about at the beginning of this presentation, which is screeners read the focused element. And there's no semantic linking right now between this input element and this error message, so that when this element receives focus, the label is read, but the corresponding error isn't read. So the user is completely unaware that the error has even happened um, through that audio-only user experience. And so again, there's this gap between what we experience visually and what's actually able to be experienced when you're listening purely through audio. Um, and what's even worse is you, know, you might submit this form as a, a user because you're not even aware that an error occurred because these errors are getting um, generated in real time. And so you might go back through your form thinking, oh, how can I try to trace back this error? And as I'll play you this sort of now screencast, you'll see. Window. <coughs> Safari, Yahoo, registration window, United States, country, pop-up button. English, language, pop-up button. 94417, content selected, postal code, edit text. Okay, so again, SN, content still talking. The uh, error wasn't announced when, when the field receives focus. Now, the user could probably use the virtual buffer to further hunt through and find that error message so they could sort of distill out what the field that has an error. But again, that's sort of a, a lot of work. And to create a good audio only user experience, you know, the ideal would be that that error message gets announced when that field gets focused so the user actually has a more immediate sense of where the error is. So this is a really good example of where you know you are doing the best with the limits of the language, but the limits of the language are failing you. You cannot express through native HTML all that you need to to make the audio experience good. And so one of the ways that you know this is being um, this, this problem is being solved is obviously through the evolution of HTML. So we're seeing you know um, the evolution of HTML in the form of HTML5. We're also seeing it in supplementary. Um, specifications like ARIA, which I would encourage you to check out. So ARIA is another mechanism, it's another W3C spec of uh, providing you as a developer or a designer additional semantics that you can add through attributes to existing HTML elements that provide more information for um, users and streamers. And so what this allows you to do then is provide more semantic linking to improve these relationships that I was showing you in the earlier screen such that these error messages like the one I was showing you will actually get announced at the right time. So in this particular case, as a developer, I can say, um, indicate to the user that this field has an error by adding this aria invalid attribute to the input element when it has an error. And then I can also semantically link the error message to the input field through this uh, attribute called aria described by, which, and that takes the ID of the element that contains the error text. And as we'll see in a second, when this zip code field now receives focus, not only will the label be read, but it'll, the streamer will tell the user that field has an error, and here's exactly what the error message it is. And again, now this is trying to bring parity between the visual experience and the audio only experience. Birthday, pop up button, one zero, content selected, then one nine seven five, content selected, year, United States, country, pop up button. English, language, pop-up button, 94417, content selected, postal code, this postal code is not located in the country you selected, invalid data edit text. So now you've got you know, more parity, the, the experiences are equal. Um, the one thing that's not equal about those two experiences though is that when you are using that sign-in form as a sighted user, those error messages are popping up as you're typing in real time, so you, you immediately know that there's errors happening. So, 
Um, what I wanted to show you is another example of how ARIA can be used to create that experience. So I'm going to continue filling out this form. Uh, in this case, I'm going to be choosing the password for my Yahoo account. And I'll play you the audio experience of what that is like and how, and we'll, and we'll sort of do a little bit of a deep dive after we're done with the demo. Safari, Yahoo, registration window, 94117, insertion of end of text, password, select an ID and password, required secure edit text. Too short. Weak. Strong. So here we have you know, a really you know, good audio experience. As I'm typing, I'm getting immediate feedback via audio that you know, my password was too weak. Oh, it's a little bit better. Oh, good password. It's a strong password. And that's exactly what happens visually. As I'm typing, I have this little indicator next to the password field that says, you know, what's the strength of your password? Um, and again, this is enabled through that um, ARIA spec that I was mentioning earlier that we use to improve the accessibility of the error messaging for the form field. So in this particular case, um, this is using one of the ARIA attributes called role, which basically specifies that this error message is an alert, and that alert should be spoken immediately when the text content of that node um, is updated. Um, so that's, that's another example. So let me go to my... Um, Internal link, what's new? I'm sorry. Does it matter which tag, or does as long as you have role equal alert? Uh, the tag in this case is irrelevant for uh, that ARIA role. Yeah. Um, okay, so those are some examples. Another um, real value that ARIA can play is giving the user uh, a greater sense of the overarching context that they're in, as well as any additional state information that the user might need in order to understand um, the next action that they should take or more information about context. So to give you a sense of that, I'm going to play you some audio of me navigating through a section of the Yahoo Mail interface. And this is, a, again, another instance of where um, I have done a really good job with the HTML. It's, it's, it's as good as possible HTML4, but still there is sort of a breakdown in, in the user experience and from the audio perspective. So here we go. Internal link, what's new? Internal link, inbox eight. Internal link, contacts. Internal link, brownie says hi. Internal link, start the new email, N. Internal link, start the new IM or SMS. Internal link, delete selected emails, delete. Internal link, reply to sender, R. Internal link, choose from different ways to reply. Does anyone having listening to that have a good sense of where you might be in the page from that audio playback and sort of, you know, what, what state you're in, you know, where you are. Does anyone have any guesses on a message? Yeah. So you're right, you are inside a message. Um, but what's interesting is there's a lot of state information and a lot of like sem semantic um, information that's sort of missing from the audio experience, right? Because we're actually inside of a selected tab. So there's, you know, we're inside a, a tab control, which is important for the user to know about, that they, you know, they can go back and navigate through the, that tab set. Um, that, that there's a toolbar as like the first um, item in that tab set that has controls that they can take advantage of. So this is all again represented through this minimal HTML because we're doing the best possible. Like we don't have like native semantics yet in HTML to represent these control types like tabs or toolbars. But this is another role that um, Aria can help us play. Entry application is, landmark. What's it? Well, so Aria again can help us in this regard to sort of bring more parity between the visual and audio experience. And so if you add ARIA to that markup, I'll show you how the experience for the streamer user becomes almost equal to that of what we see visually. Entering application landmark, what's new? Tab, one of four. Inbox, eight, tab, two of four. Contacts, tab, three of four. Brownie says hi, selected tab, four of four. Brownie says hi, toolbar item palette. Interact with, Brownie says hi, toolbar item palette. 12 items, start to UIM or SMS pop-up button. Delete selected emails, delete button. Reply to sender R button. Choose from different ways to reply pop-up button. So some cool things happened here, right? Now the user knows that there's a tab view. They know how many tabs there are. They know what tab is selected. They know that this is actually a toolbar. And even though we chose to use anchor elements for our buttons, which is very often done on the web, um, we're actually able to transform those toolbar buttons into um, buttons being spoke by the streamer user also through ARIA. So there's actually a lot of power that can be harnessed through these additional semantics, right? Um, so that's another. So that, that's another good example of um, context and how context is can really greatly improve the audio on the user experience. Um, another thing that can happen a lot is 
state changes can happen um, as a result of things popping up into view, pop-up menus, pop-up dialogues. And if focus isn't managed appropriately when those pop-ups happen, the user or the distributor has no idea that that state change happened. And again, that all goes back to sort of the fundamentals of how the streamer report. They sort of track against what is happening with regard to focus. And so um, I'll, I'll give you a quick audio example of me navigating through one of the toolbars in Gmail, and I'm going to pop up the uh, settings menu, and we'll sort of listen to what that um, audio experience is like. Select pop-up button. Refresh button. More button. 1909 button. Newer. Dim button. Older. Dim button. Settings pop-up button. Press settings pop-up button. Press the settings pop-up button, and that's sort of my only like audio cue. Nothing happened, and so that's the visual representation of what happened. Is you know something popped up, um, and this this happens quite a lot. Like dialogues pop up, menu, menus pop up. So this is another thing that um, is very easily solved when designers and developers are sort of aware of again how this technology works. So as a developer. Your responsibility here would be actually to move down focus to that control, into the dialogue, into the pop-up. As a designer, it would be a really great idea to sort of spec that out in the interaction design like that, that you're going to be giving to your developer to say, hey, you know, make sure that focus is moved into this new area. Uh, and I'll show you an example of how that can significantly improve the experience. So I've created this very simple pop-up button with a menu. Voice over on Safari, menu button example, window, HTML content has keep move to pop-up button. So I'll move focus to this. Press move to pop-up button. You are currently on a menu inside of HTML content. To move between items in this list, press Control Option right arrow or Control Option left arrow. So Voice over off. Once again, the sort of there's more parity between the visual experience and the audio experience. I was able to understand now that a menu popped up, what context I'm in now versus you know just not having any idea that there was a state change uh, that happened. Um, okay, so last example. Um, oftentimes, as I said before, you know, uh, the way streamers work is they read what is in focus, and that's how the user has a sense of you know what they are, on, what they what they're on, and how they can sort of make decisions about where to go next. But very often, is it, what happens in user interfaces is that updates are happening sort of in other parts of the user interface where the user's focus isn't at currently. So a simple example of that would be in Twitter. I'm in my home timeline. I load the page. I start moving down the timeline. I'm reading tweets. And maybe I make it you know, halfway down the page. And then what happens is the top of the timeline visually updates saying you know, new tweets are coming in. right? Now, my focus is down here. So if I'm relying purely on audio, I'm not going to hear that new tweets are available. So I'm either just going to have to sort of manually go back up to the page every once in a while and, and load in order to get those, or but I'll have no sense of that, that update happening. And this is another thing that we can solve through ARIA. So ARIA has this concept of live regions, and what it essentially allows you as a developer or designer to do is say, this portion of the page is going to be updating asynchronously, and it's going to have some important information that the user needs to know about. And so when this uh, particular portion updates, no matter where the user's focus is, I want you to announce this text so that they know that you know there's some new information for them to take advantage of. And so, if you'd like, what we can do is do a little live demo of this with uh, me and Victor. So I will add this code to Twitter via via. Hopefully, my connection is still going strong. Good. Okay. Let's see. All right. So the live reading is in there. Start with my screen reader. Voice over on Safari. Twitter slash home window. Toolbar. Block button. Menu. Twitter. New. HTML. HTML content. Interact with HTML. Internal link. Home. Internal link. Visit link. Discover. End of list. Button. Voice over help menu. Six items. Closing. Voice over help menu. Heading level three. Heading. Heading level two. Two items. Tweet. Internal link. Internal link. Today. Internal link. S ran. Internal link. Intern in 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 internal link. In internal in end of list. In, in a combination of spring tides, bad weather, and navy ribs on security practice ahead of the Jubilee pageant makes for a lousy night's nice sleep. Clickable. Internal link. 3 to M. 7. 3 7 p.m. And now we just have to wait for someone to tweet. Maybe uh, someone in the audience. <laughs> One tweet. Clickable. There we go. So thank you, Victor, for uh, tweeting for me. Mm. So that is uh, sort of the of how live regions work. And um, 
Okay, so just to review, uh, we're at the end here. So screeners, remember how they work is they read the underlying HTML, um, and specifically, in most cases, they read the focused element, and they give the user the following pieces of information, you know, what element or control is the user on, what label text does the user need to know to be able to differentiate one control from another, what context does the user need to know about, are they in a tab, are they in a toolbar, etc. Um, what properties or state information is this control checked or not checked, um, and things like um, state. Uh, most of the problems stem from this disparity between the visual and the audio experience, and most of that is rooted in um, lack of semantics in the underlying code, because it's the semantics that both describe the content, lets the user know this is a heading or a link or a list, etc. And, that's, and those semantics also, in many cases, as we saw with virtual navigation, enable a lot of default interactivity for the user. Um, and remember, um, at your disposal, you have emerging technologies and specifications like ARIA to go beyond what HTML gives you out of the box and can greatly improve um, the user experience for users who rely completely on audio. Um, and then also, the how, how important it is to track uh, and be mindful of focus changes when things pop up so that users who rely on audio can be aware of those changes as well. Um, and that live regions can also be helpful when things are getting updated completely on the other side of the, the, the page or part of the application for where the user's focus actually is. Um, and if, again, this is now uh, the sort of the very end of the presentation where I encourage you as the audience member to go ahead and learn more. So if you are a person who uh, is a Mac cat or a Mac addict or a Mac enthusiast, whatever, um, if you go to apple.com slash accessibility slash voiceover, there are a lot of great tutorials about how to use voiceover, which is the built-in streamer for the Mac. Um, the first time you start it up, which, which you can do by pressing Command F5, you will be going through a guided tutorial, which is really elegant and nice. So it's a really easy way to sort of get started understanding the problem space further. Um, if you are on Windows, there is a really great open source streamer called NVDA um, that has excellent support for web standards, particularly ARIA. Um, and it also has um, a, a great user guide, although it's not as um, guided of a tour in terms of an audio guided tour as it is, as it is on VoiceOver. You actually have to go to the help menu and then go to user guide and it brings you up a web page that has you know, uh, sort of like self-guided just text document, but um, still very useful for those of you wanting to learn more. Um, so I know we're running a little bit late, but if people uh, have questions, I'd be happy to take a few. Otherwise, I'll pass it on to Victor. Can you go back to your own? Yeah, sure. Does voiceover support audio? Voiceover does support audio. It keeps getting better and better, actually, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Do yeah. search crawlers follow the same pattern? Like, can, do they actually listen to the audio text? So the question is, um, how, how well do search engines leverage ARIA? Um, I actually asked that of Google about a year ago because I kept thinking these semantics are really great and like, why couldn't search engines take advantage of these? Of course, um, that's all private information. Like, I, I think Google said, that's a great idea. Yeah. And, and so so they, they very well could be doing it, but um, how search engines mine content I think is all um, <laughs> so, yeah. There's no, there's nothing that's, I will say this definitively, there's nothing that would stop them from being able to leverage this stuff. Yes? So the uh, the experience, the, the audio only experience, it seems, or feels super functional, and it's like a, like a wireframe. There's no sort of styling, if you will. It, are there any standards now or in the works for adding sonification, if you will, where you could actually tell that like, different parts of the page would use a slightly different voice, you would have different background sounds, <laughs> or like sort of uh, just using audio cues other than spoken words to indicate the function, you, just as, like we use, you know, shading, colors, okay. and so forth. Great. So the question was, um, this all seems sort of rather utilitarian, like I, can, I know I'm in a tab control or a, a menu, it's very functional, but it doesn't have sort of the visual like sexiness or fidelity that you are you have as a side user. Is there anything that's emerging to help with that to sort of give the user um, more? Um, I don't know actually if that's the case. Victor, have, are you aware of anything like that? Probably won't be By default, no. But there there were attempts to, to do that. There are parties that do that, but by default, you don't have that. 
Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I didn't notice any uh, the HTML5 tags in there. I'm wondering if screen readers, screen readers are still behind or if they, w when they are going to start incorporating those new tags. Okay, great question. So how well is HTML5 being adopted from the perspective of assistive technology? Um, HTMLaccessibility.com, or HTML5accessibility.com will give you all, all you want to know. It's actually maintained by um, a guy named Steve Faulkner, who is a member of an accessibility consultancy called the Passiello Group. And um, Steve has been like a long time um, accessibility guru, and he maintains that site with a great amount of effort. And um, as I remember last, Firefox has the best support for mapping HTML5 elements to back to accessibility APIs such that screen readers can actually take advantage of them. Um, but he sort of ranks each individual browser and sort of gives you more granular detail about how, just how much is supported by what, what browser. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, cool, thank you. Because this is the kind of stuff that no guidelines ever going to be able to write out for you. You have to spend probably, I don't know, depends on your cognitive ability, maybe it's a one hour time, maybe it's two hours time. It, it's the kind of thing that will come with experience, okay? So you've got to try all of these things, accessibility and assistive technology, in order to be able to actually understand what's going on in that user's head as much as you can. So anyway, so this is the most, uh, can you by the way see my uh, presentation, I don't know if it's on the screen, but I hope it is. Not okay. No, that's what I hate. Yeah. Why? Really? Oh, you know what, I think I know why. There you go. Uh -huh. Voice over has this beautiful feature where I can, where I can turn off the screen with just a single gesture. Uh, I may mention it to you because it's a great testing tool. Okay, well now you're seeing one of the most boring slides. Because uh, you only know who I am, and uh, the one information you may not know is how to find me on Twitter. Um, so, okay, so what is accessibility to me? There's so many definitions. For the purpose of this talk, I just want you to think as what accessibility is the user experience. Essentially, it does come down to how user is going to like, dislike, or react to what you create. You can make them angry, you can make them laugh at you because, you know, oh, they don't even know how to put uh, labels, or whatever it is. So users may react to what you've spent hours of, of your time creating, and, and that sort of, that is what constitutes user experience. What the reaction of the user is going to be to whatever you try to create. To me, that ends up being accessibility. 
Okay, actually, you know, let me go back to this slide because I pulled out, I found this really interesting phrase from Paul Rand, and it's a really long quote, so I don't even remember all of it. The one thing I do remember from it, which I really, really like, is, is that the purpose of design is to give meaningful value to the user. Because at the end of the day, if you design something that doesn't have any meaning to, to your audience, or to the part of your audience, it's like your design goes out of the door. You know, the iPhone could have been a great iPhone, uh, but it would be just a piece of glass for blind people if Apple didn't introduce all the amazing tools into this tool, in, into this phone. So, so think about this meaningful value whenever you go about designing stuff. And you know, the rest of the code you could probably ignore, although I think it is a great code, uh, especially in using part two. Um, Okay, so user experience, let's break it down. Again, uh, uh, this is just all sort of my interpretation of what I think of user experience. You probably find hundreds of definitions of this. I think of user experience as having three major components. Reachability, uh, in a geek language it's called input. Um, I, I, again, hopefully I'm not too simplifying it, but simplifying it too much, but what I mean by reachability is, is how does the user reach the interface? There's, there's many ways of doing that. The second part is the feedback. What kind of feedback does the user get as a result of reaching out, um, of, as, a, yeah, as a result of to, you know, reaching out uh, to those elements? And of course, this all comes down to interaction. Input plus feedback or reach, reachability plus feedback is what creates the interaction. It's kind of like a loop that sort of never ends because depending on what feedback you get, that's how you decide what your next action is going to be. So to scientific. All right, reachability. So many ways to reach out to those elements or to those to that content. We all know about keypads. In fact, I was thinking if I had a bit more time, I would have loved at some point to do a little talk on how the history has history of mobile accessibility uh, really started. But you remember those Nokia phones that had buttons and stuff? <laughs> Great, right? Many people still swear by these things. That's one way of reaching uh, elements on the screen. Another way, obviously, is by touch, which is what many people do these days, including myself. The third way is gestures. Shaking your phone, Soon it's going to be waving, you know, very soon it's going to be throwing, whatever else. <laughs> um, thinking, I didn't put it on the list, but it's probably coming down the pipeline pretty soon. Voice control, Siri, right? Or any kind of voice assistant. This is also a way of user, user trying to manipulate the interface. Um, so this is, this is some of the types of, of how you can reach elements. So feedback. Feedback. As we know it, it's visual feedback, which is like you get a visual alert, you get uh, some sort of animation that tells you that something visually happened on the screen. There's an audible alert, some people love it, other people hate it, but everybody likes that nice swooshing sound when you send an email, right? On the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> or you get annoyed, or maybe it seems people like, you know, like when you get an email, it's like, Right? Also, it's something we take for granted, but if you didn't have those audio alerts, something would be missing. It just wouldn't because you'd have to every time look to make sure, was my mail actually sent out, and how would you do it anyway? Do you know when you want to check whether your email has been sent out? Right? So stuff like that. Um, so there's audible, there's haptic. Is, is that familiar term here, haptic feedback? Right? You get this vibration in your phone. That's what they call haptic feedback. It's in its early stages right now, but it has been actually cleverly used by uh, Google folks uh, in building their accessible solutions for Android. That means when you, when you move your finger on the screen, it'll actually vibrate to let you know that you just landed on the element. Really cool, smart way of doing it. Um, I reached out to Apple folks asking why they don't do it, and they had, they had their... Uh, um, also pretty reasonable explanation, but you know, battery drain and stuff like that. You know. Anyways, the, the point being is that this is one of the ways of, of uh, uh, getting feedback. So interaction. Uh, many ways to express interaction. To me, it comes down to three things. What am I interacting with? 
does it have a meaning and what I try and, what I ask him to do essentially right and if the interaction is meaningful then I should have answers to all those questions if the, answer, if the interaction is not meaningful such as I'm sending an email and as a blind person you're showing me the animation but I'm, I hear no sound at all okay I don't know what happened right so so those are the kind of things you, you know this artist got to be thinking about, or, or this is what really constitutes a bad interaction. Instead, you know, I want to hear the interaction in my language, which is, if I can't see, I want that interaction to happen as an audio experience, even at the expense of, of visual experience. To be honest with you, like, at that point, I wouldn't care. Like, even if you didn't show me animation, as long as there's a sound, yeah, I'm happy. That's fine. So, that's your interaction. Okay, so um, here we come to, to this very interesting topic of uh, why we're here today, which is accessibility. So, um, interaction used with disabilities is a different matter altogether. Um, geez, I, I, I feel the phone is buzzing. Why you guys tweeting or what? Mentioning my deal or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's okay. Um, so, um, let me go back to this thing here. Okay, so for disabled users, things need to happen slightly differently. Why? Um, even though the word disabled is sort of like being uh, used in so many contexts and some people don't like it, let's just agree that people who have disability are differently abled, which means that they probably interact with the same devices, with the same objects in life, in some different ways from what you are used to, right? So for example, if I needed to turn on the light in the room, right? What you do, you just come up to the switch and you're like, done. Okay, what I have to do is like, this is, you know, you find this, so this is my interaction. I gotta find this light and I have to see, okay, is it actually switched on or is it switched off? Then my mind goes like, okay, if it's up, I need to turn it down. If it's up and down, I need to turn it back up. So. It means that my experience of interacting with the same objects, including mobile devices, is going to be different. Now, what, what is it that actually helps me to have that different interaction, or to have a more meaningful interaction, is the assistive technology. One of those Todd already showed you, which is a screen reader, there's many kinds of assistive technologies out there. Uh, I want you guys to think of the word assistive, because it's really important. I'm going to tell you in a second why. So we got some assistant that's going to stand between the user who, is, who has some disability, physical disability, or visual disability, or sensory disability, whatever it is, and that something is going to enable that user to interact with the same devices that you do, right? So let's take an iPhone. So what does this mean for design? Okay, so that means there's something in between me and that device. And that something has its own mind, I guess I want to call it. It may be a piece of software, it could be another hardware that I need to use. Uh, maybe it's another fine glass that has a works. You don't have to understand all of it. Pick one, get familiar with it, and become expert, if you will. But you need to understand what is it that makes the technology work. Most importantly, what is that in that software that makes it possible for your audience, for your user, blind user, or whichever one you're targeting, to be able to use that device. I hope I'm not too complicating this, but the word assistive is really important because it's, it's something that's being introduced in your otherwise everyday interaction. Okay, and I just said that, right? Therefore, because it's another thing that uh, stands between the user and the device that you're designing for, you have to understand how it works. Because you can't ignore it, it's already there. 
And here we come to the challenge of the ages. Everybody knows what this picture is? <laughs> Sorry? Yes, what? Come on, make it accessible. What's the picture? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? iPhone. iPhone, okay. Good. But it's iPhone with no information on it. So when the iPhone came out in 2007, that's essentially what many modern people thought. Okay, another cool gadget for everybody else, right? Essentially, the challenge has become, how do you make a flat piece of glass accessible to people who are used to tactile experience? You have to feel buttons, you have to feel something, because otherwise, I mean, flat desk or flat table, you know, kind of doesn't have any meaning. But now I think that that, that piece of glass actually is the coolest technology around, right? We've introduced this amazing technology that has no tactile experience to it. You know, it's just showing something. And so Apple uh, has taken that challenge, and when iPhone 3GS came out and the rumors started spreading that actually it will be accessible, people are like, okay, we want to see it. Turns out it actually wasn't all that complicated. What was probably complicated is to realize that there was a problem. So many people said it's impossible, and somebody there, I don't know if it was Apple people or whether they contracted somebody, I have no inside knowledge of that. But clearly somebody said, we can do it. But I think we know what the problem is, and we may even have the idea of how to solve it. Uh, I don't know how many people here have iPhones, uh, but those solutions are, are built into every device that Apple ships. Whether it's Apple TV, whether it's, I, whether it's iPod Touch, or whether it's iPad, whether it's iPhone, it's right there. And this panel, if the picture comes out right, so I can trust, is in every device. And the way you access it is through settings, general, I'm gonna repeat that in the end, but uh, those of you who don't know, it's under settings, general, accessibility. You've got lots of interesting solutions on, in that panel. One of one of those, uh, I think, Sahir? Sahir, sorry about that. Sahir is going to talk about, it, which is uh, Zoom. Uh, this is a great thing because, you know, if you don't want to use a screen reader, you just want to modify the screen, you got that. Anyway, I'm going to consider it on screen reader because that's uh, what I'm mostly familiar with. And so Apple made it possible for blind people to basically uh, give a voice to the flat piece of glass. That's essentially what happened. Okay, Android accessibility. It's an interesting uh, uh, topic. Uh, what you see actually is an older uh, accessibility panel, unfortunately, I couldn't get the latest one. But in, throughout the rest of this presentation, when I'm gonna talk, when I'm talking about Android, I'm, I actually will be talking about primarily Ice Cream Sandwich, which is the latest release of Android. They've got some interesting things going on, but it's not until uh, ice cream uh, sandwich that you're actually going to see that interesting stuff coming up. Uh, they did have before that a screen reader as well. They've done some cool stuff with haptic feedback, like I mentioned before, that when you move your finger on the screen, it will actually give you tactile feedback when you land on, on an element. Uh, but um, the cool stuff really starts with ice cream sandwich uh, 4.0, which hopefully it will become more and more available uh, to people. All right, how does it work? So let's do a quick uh, demo. Any questions so far while I'm connecting this thing? Twitter. It's a 
audio. Screen curtain lock. Oh, perfect. Uh, the same feature that I mentioned is you can turn on the screen. Uh, I forgot that I usually, I'm so secret whenever I use the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because one time I was checking my something on, on the bus and somebody was just like, oh, you're checking stock markets. I'm like, you know what? Safari. <laughs> 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 okay, so what I'm going to show you guys, unfortunately, I'll have to explain what I'm doing here. But um, the way basically they implemented accessibility on the iPhone is by implementing several simple gestures that let you explore the interface of the touch screen in two ways. One way is easy. Anybody New notification from Boxstar. Boxstar. Um, one one uh, easy way and the other more difficult. The easy way. Uh, that New notification from Boxstar. Boxstar. <laughs> 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 uh, can you stop tweeting? <laughs> 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 So um, the beginner could learn that easy way, and the other way is kind of for more experienced people or for those who are interested in, in really um, you know, in, in, in like exploring the interface for real. Well, the first for the first time in the history. New notification from Boxstar. Uh, Boxstar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Way, um, the easy way is you only need to know literally two gestures. One is flick left, just like this, as if you were swiping like this. Mm -hmm. And then flick right, like this. And if you just do this on the screen, you could basically go from the top. Speech on. Pandora. This way. Finance folder. Ada App Store. One new item. Notice how it tells me that there's one new item right? available in the App Store. And also visually... New notification from Boxstar. Speech on. This is one thing I want to point out, is that visually you also see the black square moving along. This is great for people who have either cognitive disability or some reading disabilities, because it helps to reinforce where exactly the cursor is. It's not for blind people, right, as you can imagine. And that cursor will disappear when you turn off the, the screen here. So it's a nice little touch. But I'm sure it helps somebody out of that. And if it doesn't, so what's the big deal? You know what I mean? <laughs> no, but for it, right? I mean, that's... Okay. Speech on. Okay, stop to me. <laughs> New notification from Bob... <laughs> New notification from Bob Star. Bob Star. Sorry, I should have turned it off, sorry. Anyway, so I can do this and... Finance folder. Eight apps. Eight apps. App Store. One new item. New stand folder. One item. And I'm just swiping right this. iTunes. With one finger. Utilities folder, four apps. Okay, if I wanted to see how many emails I have, I, I could just touch, because uh, I know that my, my uh, I have a dog at the bottom, and I could just touch the mail icon. Mail, 163 new items. Okay, the second way, if I have adventures and I just really know how to explore stuff, I could just drag my finger across the screen. Compass, games folder, nine apps. Reset radio, Yelp. Compass, Zello, Wolfram at YouTube. So when I come to the icon, I can double tap to open the application. App Store, one new item. Okay. App Store, updates, heading. And you notice it told me that it's you know, App Store. And I'm, 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 the reason it said updates is because the updates tab is currently active. But again, at the bottom, you can see there's four tabs. Featured, tab, one of five. Remember, tab, uh, remember Todd was showing you tabs before? Same thing here, one of five. Isn't it great to know that the tab has five items? Of course, especially on the touch screen. Now remember, if on the desktop we only can move two ways, right? It's either tab forward, tab backward, or left and right arrow key. I mean, I don't know, maybe my tab has seven items. Does that mean I have to move finger just a little bit? Or I have to move it more? So that semantic information or meaningful information has even more meaning on the touch screen because the screen can be large, the screen can be small, 
and given user uh, who, who does not see information about the size of the, of the object of your work is very, very important. So anyways, I can just move through these tabs. Categories, tab, two, top 25, tab, three of five, search, tab, four of five, selected, updates, one item, tab, five of five. Ah, uh -huh. what was different about this one? Exactly, you told me it's selected. Awesome. You know it's selected, I know it's selected. So guess what I'm not going to be doing here? I'm not going to start, I'm not going to start searching, right? New notification from Bob. If I want to start searching, I just... Search, tab, four to five. Double tab. Last, FM, selected, search, tab, four. Actually, again, now it told me search is selected. So, so this is, uh, this is basically, uh, how simple uh, they App Store, one new item. Uh, on the iPhone. So before I get off the iPhone, I'm just going to show you one quick thing for those of you who design for the web. I'm going to touch the Safari app. Safari. Double tap. Safari. Today, LD equals as one to SBF. Uh-oh. That wasn't something. Um, okay. So you see the home page, right? Um, it's a Yahoo home page and... Um, on the web, just like on a desktop, what, what Todd was showing you, remember you're still, de still dealing with the screen reader. In that respect, it's no different from the screen reader on a desktop. It still needs to know all the information. If you are providing a list of headlines, so they have to be headings probably, right? If you want people to click on something, so probably they have to be links, right? For two reasons. One is the user needs to know that this is something that actually they can click on. On the touch screen, more so important because there's so much stuff on the touch screen. Not enough you have to figure out what layout it is, but you also need to navigate between text and links and all that stuff. So obviously it's very, very important. So I can obviously again drag my finger. Link, image. <laughs> School misspells its own name. The embarrassing error can be found everywhere. Signs. Certificates and business card one slash forty eight one slash next button one next one slash four prep button you can see what I'm moving right one slash four down twelve eight hundred thirty five ninety seven dot zero three three R D N H L zero down forward dim button so anyway so let's uh, let's just so so let's say I wanted to look at this page the way um, let's say I just wanted to so I can either drag now of course dragging. It works, it's probably more fun on the iPad because you've got a bigger screen. On the iPhone, you end up doing a lot of scrolling because, you know, this is just the first page, there's so much more stuff out there. And I can scroll, there's a gesture for that, it's just three fingers up. Page 206. And you can see page 4 of 6. Scrolls. Page 5 of 6. So, how do I find out which page, page I'm on? I have another gesture. You know, guys don't have to remember all that right now. Just believe me that all of that stuff is available. If you want to move between screens left and right, there's also a gesture and so on and so forth. What I wanted to show you is one cool feature that they've implemented is called virtual wheel, or they call it rotor. And if you place your two fingers on the screen and you move them. Language. Characters. You see this thing? Words. Headings. Zero headings. Page no, no, just, uh, just, uh, just the <laughs> so let's look at the links. Links. Twelve links. Uh -huh. And so now I've got another gesture, which is if I am kind of like a beginner user and I'm really scared of dragging my finger around because it takes so long. Remember you're dealing with the cognitive. It's it's a, it's an amazing shift because now People who are used to browsing in linear fashion, you're asking them to actually click on the left or the right. It's pretty, pretty scary for some people, but it's pretty cool because that's where the future is going to be managed. Especially when we start manipulating objects on the screen and stuff. It's, it's really where the world is going. And so, new notification. So, so I wanted. I have a gesture that lets me. Link not found. Help. Link. Legal. Link. Privacy. Link. So I just move between links. If I wanted to move between form fields, I, I again I, I turn this thing. Form controls. Two form control. Next button. Right. Prep. Dim. Button. See that kind of stuff. So so all of this is available on the iPhone, and uh, it, it's you can you find tons of videos on YouTube on how these things work. 
the only thing that I want you guys to take uh, to remember from today is that you have to understand your kind of experience and you have to own it almost. You have to know what the user has to go through to, to understand the kind of work. Okay, so let's go quickly back. Swing back. So here's your summary. How does the iOS uh, work? You've got flicking, which is the thing that I was showing you, swiping like this with one finger. You've got touch exploration. Uh, if you just just a factoid, uh, most uh, most people that I've met at least use both, especially on the iPhone because it's such a small screen. Sometimes on very crowded pages, you have to literally like move half, not even half an inch. I mean, the space gets so 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 so. Um, Know, so so um, dotted with, with, with all these elements, it's almost hard to move from one to the other. But but in instances where you kind of know where things are, and if you want to click the down button, you don't just go like you know like flick 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 flick. You actually move down because you know down button is usually in the right top right corner, right? And things like that um, are really important. So so there's there's this touch exploration, and there's this flicking, uh, which is the sequential exploration. So um, the next thing uh, I wanted to show you guys, so you don't think that I'm just bashing Google, but they're really, they're doing some really cool work too. And I wanted to, I wanted you to see what's actually going on on Ice Cream um, Sandwich, uh, the, the latest version of Android. Some of the things they're doing I really, really like. It's very challenging, I think, for some blind people. But again, um, considering where, the, where everything is going, it's it's very cool. And is it I'm going to summarize for you what this is all about. Let's go to Press, visit, and what? Tell me if you. Hi, everyone. I'm Alan Grimmer, at Master Science Farmers, in a series of videos on the new accessibility features available in Android 4.0, also known as Ice Cream Sandwich. I have a brand new Galaxy Nexus here running Android 4.0 that I'm going to set up for accessibility. I've already turned it on, so it's currently showing the welcome screen. To enable accessibility, draw a rectangle starting at the top left corner of the screen, going around clockwise, closing it off again at the top left corner of the screen. After you turn on Explore by Touch, you can touch the screen to learn what's under your finger. For example, the current screen contains app icons. Find one of them by touching the screen and sliding your finger around. So after turning on accessibility, you hear uh, the, and it starts up the touch exploration tutorial. Uh, I'm just going to run through the tutorial real quick. Uh, so first I want to touch anyone on the screen. So Good. Keep sliding your finger around the screen until you find at least one more icon. So here I'm touching the Gmail icon. It's uh, near the center of the screen. If I move up. To activate something that you're touching, Tap it, slide your finger until you find the icon for the browser, then tap the icon once to activate it. So just to get a sense of where I am, going to move around. Phone. Oh. People disabled. Clock. Camera. Calendar. Browse, your finger is touching the browser icon. Tap once to activate the icon. Okay, so I found the browser icon, and I can lift my finger once and place it back on the screen to tap. Good. To move to the next the lesson, find and activate the next button located near the bottom right corner of the screen. I'm just going to put my finger back down where it was before. Browser. Move towards the bottom right of the screen. People, Gmail, disabled market. It's reading out all the icons that I cross as I go to the bottom of the screen. Good. To move to the next lesson, Those are the instructions find and the activate the, the next button next. And there's the button. I'm going to tap once to activate it. To scroll through a list, you can slide two fingers along the screen. For example, the current screen contains a list of app names that can scroll up or down. First, try to identify a few items in the list by sliding one finger around. So as before, I'm going to touch explore by just putting one finger on the screen. 
Good. Keep sliding your finger around to find at least one more item. So I'll move down. Now place two fingers on an item in the list and slide both fingers up. If you reach the top of the screen, lift your fingers, place them lower on the list, and continue sliding up. So I can move my finger around. People. Phone. Up and down. Camera. The list to read each item. Calendar. Browser. And as the tutorial just instructed me to do, I can put two fingers on the screen right next oh. to each other. And move up. Good. Keep sliding your fingers up to scroll some more. Showing items 4 to 11 of 32. Okay, so I've reached the top of the list. I'm going to put my fingers lower on the screen. Music. You have completed the tutorial. To exit, find and touch the finish button. Okay, so I've finished the tutorial. Uh, and you'll notice that as I scroll, Stop. I get audio feedback as to Showing where I am. Showing items 7 to 14 of 32. And when I finish scrolling, it tells me exactly where I am. Now I'm just going to move message music all the way down the list. Set top. You have completed the, the tutorial. To the exit, finish. And there's the finish button. So I'll tap that once. Use Google location. So we're back at the main setup screen. Uh, the center right side of the screen, there's a start button. So to find that, I'm just going to scan the screen very quickly. Welcome, English United. Okay, I'm going to stop at this point because I hope you guys got an idea. Uh, what, the reason I wanted you to see the whole tutorial is an interesting uh, choice that has been made. When when you turn on when you get an Apple device, uh, unlike on a desktop, you actually initially get introduced to like, would you like to go to a voiceover tutorial? There's no such thing on the iPhone. Probably because Apple thinks that it's simple enough and people should be able to figure it out. So far, it has been the case. I haven't seen anyone who said, "Oh my God, I'm." So maybe it's work. Uh, Google uh, chose a different path, and they they thought because it's so touch. You notice that there there is mostly touch based. There's no sort of like flicking and stuff. And so maybe they thought we need to give the user a tutorial. I don't know. I'm just bringing this to your attention so that you make these possibly these kind of decisions or this kind of this kind of thinking when you build your stuff. But I thought it was very interesting. Um, so let's quickly. So again, in, in Android, just like in, in uh, iOS devices, we've seen uh, more emphasis on touch exploration, I think, than there is on Apple. Uh, but Apple gives you both options. So Apple basically says, if, you, if you're just a beginner, you know, you can just go sequentially, you know, by just flipping left and right. If you are becoming more advanced, go ahead and you know, use the layout to figure out what's on the right, what's on the left. Google sort of goes one way further and says, you know, I think, you're smart enough, you can figure it out, right? So just start dragging the figures and different gestures slightly, but you know, the ideas are the same. What I did like about Google, and somebody sort of, I heard in the room somebody noticed, which was, what was different about Google implementation? Anything stood out, stood out for you? Sound feed. Sound, yes. The, sound, the, the use of sound was very interesting. Now, the cool thing is that you can turn it off, but I really think that some of the stuff they did with sound, like for example, when you scroll up and it goes like, you know, it, it goes like uh, ascending, uh, with ascending tones, I, I thought it was kind of clever. You know, it does reinforce the point that the user is moving up and then you move down. Some people may say it's too much, uh, but you know, some of these things, is maybe it's better to have too much at the beginning, especially if you know you can turn it off. But I think it was, it was very interesting using the position of audio. They use many more sound cues than Apple. Apple does use some sound cues, like for example, you know when you're not on an item, uh, and it does give you clicks when you, for example, wrap from one row to another and things like that. But you know, Google, I think, takes itself to the next level where they give you, you know, almost at some point, you're probably going to be, you probably will want to turn those sounds off because they're probably going to get annoying. But yeah, I thought it was an interesting approach. Sort of as an initial experience for the user. All right. So what can possibly go wrong with these things? As you know, that 
there's always something that can go wrong, right? I'm going to show one of the basic examples. There's many things that can go wrong. Uh, because the audience is so mixed, I'm not going to go into like two complicated interactions. One that's occurring quite frequently is this. What's the password better? You're going to figure it out by watching the videos. So this is one of the native apps on the iPhone. In this instance, we're looking at the Southwest app, uh, which uh, should allow me to go and buy tickets or reserve my flights or whatnot. Uh, so I'm going to just do a couple of flicks left and right to see what I can actually do with this app. It does go back to what Todd was talking about, which is there's a total disparity from what you see on the screen and what the user hears. You wouldn't have never guessed that if you didn't try for the screen here. There's really no way, unless you had access to the source code and you were like, oh, I got it, I know exactly what's the, you know what I mean? It, it is the kind of thing that you will only know if you ever tried it for yourself and when you created the app or you created the interface and said, let me grab a cup of coffee and actually run through this thing by just using the simple do-it-yourself technique, right? No, you know, don't try to be smart about it or anything. This you would have spotted right away, right? The minute you touch your finger here, button, button, but oops, something is wrong. And uh, this is why, you know, so important. But you can see how easily visual experience can get out of sync with uh, audio experience. Okay, I want to bring this up. Uh, I hope I'm not going to confuse you with this, but remember how at the beginning I said that assistive technology is is the uh, is, is is the software that has the mind of its own. What I mean by that is, in order to give you all of these tools like flicks and all these gestures that you can do on the iPhone, the assistive technology needs to monitor what the user is doing, right? Because otherwise, if I single touch with my finger. And if there was no screen reader on, on you know, monitoring my finger, it would never know that it's supposed to announce the icon, right? So it needs to kind of sit in the background like a CIA agent and just kind of watch you. Like, what is this guy doing? Okay. Oh, he's single. Okay, I better announce what, you know what I mean? And if he has enough, this, he or she, whatever it is, the screen reader has enough information about what you're doing, then if it has enough information about what is that that you're touching, it can give you that feedback so that you can confidently continue interacting with your device, right? So, um, uh, we develop these days these interfaces on the web where people can swipe and people can scroll. The problem is that the web doesn't let us express those swipes and scrolls in any language that the screen reader can understand because they're <coughs> simulated by using things like JavaScript. There's nothing in the code that clearly says, oh, this is where you swipe and this is how you swipe. It literally says, when the user places his finger here and when they release it here, that is a swipe. But that's sort of inferred. This is not actually stated anywhere. And therefore, screen reader has no idea that where, where the user is supposed to swipe and, and what's going to happen, uh, even if the user did know they are supposed to swipe, they're not exactly sure what they're supposed to do with that swipe. If I didn't confuse you already, uh, then uh, great. If I did confuse you, then I'm sorry. But that's the best I can express it. So those swipes and scrolls are really, right now we have difficulty with those things because uh, the screen reader stands in between and we, the developer has no way to tell the screen reader, hey, do the, um, the user is supposed to swipe here. So this is, obviously a challenge for us. Alternative could be is, for example, you could place hidden buttons that, that will let the user like to like next and previous, as opposed to swipe, for example, if it's to swipe between pages or whatever. You could give them pre previous and next buttons, but it will depend on your specific case. I'm just pointing out to you that that is the existing problem on the web. Okay, so let's get to actually what, what to do, and I, I, I guess I'm gonna repeat myself that's the purpose of the summary, right? The conclusion. 
what do you do? You understand the technology. Um, I think I said it too many times, but I will say as many times as you need me to, so you guys remember this. If you don't understand what the user is using, you cannot design interface that will speak to them. That is like a holy grail. Uh, learn their habits. Remember, screen reader users are users too. And you know, some of them like uh, Pepsi, some of them like Coca-Cola. They also tend to like how their screen readers talk, whether they say too much or too little. There's this thing called verbosity, which means that screen reader user may decide to turn off some features, so they may decide to turn on others. So understanding how your intended user, uh, how your targeted user is using that device or, or that website is very important. So those two things, um, you have to think about. There's no escape. All right, so by understanding user, uh, we mean that it's pretty easy to do these days. You know, it's not like five years ago we had to buy a $1,000 worth screen reader and you have to install it and it, God forbid you work for some organization that doesn't let you install anything, then you're screwed completely, right? So a lot of the things are built in right now, and since I'm talking about mobile, both Android and iPhone, uh, sorry, and iOS have these tools built in. So whenever you get a device, uh, the, o the only exception being Android, uh, which is if you get something like a gingerbread, uh, I don't know how you guys are familiar with the Android series, but you know, there are all these names, gingerbread, and I don't know what the focus but uh, depending on the version of Android, you may get less of accessibility or more of it. Um, something is built in there, that's for sure. So you can test it, and if you don't know something, you just go out on Twitter and you blast it out and you say, hey, can somebody recommend what should I do with this device? Because I'm trying to test and I don't know where to go from here. On iOS, obviously, is a great example. If you've got the latest iPhone or you installed iOS 5, which is the latest, all you have to do is just triple click your home key. You just press it three times and the voiceover is going to come on. With no, you don't have to do anything. And if you forget about it, no big deal. You go to settings, general, accessibility, and you can just turn it on. Okay. Remember that? We saw this before, right? Um, hopefully the image is still coming up. But that's your accessibility panel uh, in iOS where everything starts. And you find this stuff again under settings, general, accessibility. Um, and I put triple click home because that's another way to enable. All right, Android, you draw a square. That's an interesting choice, by the way. I, I wonder if you came up with this. Kind of they probably thought that maybe square is the easiest uh, shape to draw. But it's an, it's an image. I'm kind of curious uh, who decided that. Anyway, you draw a, screen, uh, you draw a square at the top of the screen and that should turn on accessibility in ice cream, uh, ice cream sandwich. So where to get more information? Uh, Apple has their own website, apple.com slash accessibility. Lots of stuff. There's actually a video, a longer video about the iPhone. Um, and Google has their page at google.com slash accessibility. Um, where you can find stuff about Android, and from there you can find their YouTube videos, including the one that I'm just showing you, um, that kind of stuff. And um, you can also visit accessibility.yahoo.com slash library. I think I forgot to click on this. Okay. So, so resources are available too, but honestly, if you know how to use search engine, you really have no excuse. Come on. Right? <laughs> you know, when I see re rehabilitation folks coming in and they're saying, you know, oh, I didn't know all this thing existed. Really? Wow. I've been in this field for 10 years. Hello? You use search engine on everyday basis, right? All you need to do is just key in a couple of terms. Yes, granted, there's a lot of information on there, but you have a good place to start. So really, these days, I just want to repeat this thing about being curious. That's really your very first thing. If you're not a curious person, I have no advice for you. But if you're a curious person, <laughs> <laughs> And the bonus, there's just a new website that came up. Uh, it's called a11ybuzz.com. I think they're trying to make it into like a repository of all things accessibility. You'll find anything about 
uh, different disabilities, different articles, very interesting articles. There's stuff for developers, there's stuff for designers. It's a constantly growing, growing website, and because it's a community driven, you're also welcome to sign up for uh, A11Y Buzz and submit your own link. So if you find something on the web, you can add it to, to one of the categories there. It's a really, really cool source. So help build and make it better. And by the way, if you don't know, A11Y stands for accessibility. Because there's 11 letters in the word accessibility. It starts with A, ends in Y. All right, thank you so much. I hope this was useful. <laughs>
you are in your system preferences, universal access, you turn on your, your Zoom feature. So um, that said, you could do option, option Apple plus key to be able to zoom in. Um, I use this on a day-to-day -day basis. So as far as being able to sit at a desk with your correct posture and relax, I'm able to do it without, uh, prior to this, it's literally just having to press something against your face to, to read it. Um, another thing that I enjoy as far as programming, I think some of you guys might like it anyway, but your eyes would become tired. Um, for me, visually, my eyes are light sensitive. So as you're working, you can actually invert everything, make it more of a relaxing uh, black on white. So the text itself is, uh, for me, it's friendlier. It's not this big glare on, on your eyes. Uh, that said, on a mobile platform, I've enjoyed Android more as far as the, on the browser level, you're able to pinch zoom on the screen. Uh, for most apps though, I guess this is something that, seeing everything that Victor showed as far as accessibility with voice, what's lacking on apps, if you have any type of tab on the bottom, you're not able to zoom in, you're not able to pinch zoom. A majority of them, I know on Android, you can actually still turn on. If you have a table view, you can turn on zooming on it. I haven't seen that on anything. Uh, iOS related. So that's something that is a challenge also with um, all of the apps as far as if you open up your iPhone. Yes, you can triple click on it, but as you can see, if I'm zoomed in on a screen, if I have a 20 or uh, 27 inch monitor, yeah, you still have real estate. If you're zoomed in big, but you can still move around, and you can see everything. Here on a cell phone, it's, it's too much. It's like I can see two things and I have to scroll, scroll, scroll. It's not a it, for me, it's not a comfortable experience. So something, even having seen what Victor showed, I, I like the idea of being able to drag your finger and having more of a magnification. It doesn't have to be uh, a fancy transition up, but if it was just dragging your finger and then you're getting, okay, this is the Apple Mon and it's larger in size, just that one, that I think for me, for my own visual acuity, that would be comfortable. I don't, I don't need to be able to hear everything, but at least to have a comfortable uh, viewing experience on one piece at a time with the finger, I think that would be a, a slick addition. Um, as far as haptic, I liked my own personal thing with, I think somebody needs to make a, a, a haptic loop bomb that you could then send to your friend and just drain their entire phone battery. <laughs> <laughs> I think work on that. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. I mean, I don't know, to me this is, it's, it's a different uh, visual experience obviously, or a different accessibility experience, but for me, I'm very thankful. Um, comparing it to Windows, I haven't gone back to Windows. I know they have Zoom Text, which is available, but again, it, it, it involves you installing it on a computer, um, not having checked the latest uh, Windows operating system to see if they've improved. I can't speak on it, but in the past, they've had something where the actual area of the screen that you're able to zoom in is a small tab, so. It's like as if you had a ruler on the bottom of your screen and the text on that is big. So for me, it's uh, not a comfortable working environment where it's, for me, in that, in that instance, it's too small. So um, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them, but to me, it was more of just a uh, show and tell. Hi, my name is Nick. Hi. Uh, Windows 7 actually has full screen zoom like OS 10 does now. Okay, great. Uh, the shortcuts are window key plus and minus. Ah, nice. And is it, do you have to turn it, do you have to initially enable it? Because for me, no. it would, okay. Um, if your graphics drivers aren't new enough, it might only be the zoom bar. Okay. That you're used to. Okay, so say the keys again? Window key plus. Okay. Key plus. Awesome. Any other questions? Okay, I guess. No. Do you have a question? No. Uh, great, I think that's about it. Uh, before you leave, we're going to do the wrap up. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, sure. Um, one, of, one of the things, and I hope it's not a misconception, one of the things one was wondering when we design stuff is like, when you're in, in an interface where you have pop-ups happening, especially on the web, yeah. does that often happen, for example, pop-up would happen and you don't actually see it because the focus actually hasn't moved to the area where an alert happened? Or well, this is a very rare um, I've, I've seen more stuff where there's a pop-up behind the screen and they're just trying to get a hit on the video so it's playing in the background. So how would you know that there's a pop-up? Is there any like, how, how do we deal with situations like that? Um, Just guess? 
No, I mean, yeah, if it was, I would probably have to hit it, you know, Apple tab to, to look if I'm missing it, why am I not able to, to see it? I would, give, I would give it a zoom out and then check behind windows and then zoom back in to see what this tab is. Okay. We do, and while you're picking this, I was just going to say, do we have any questions to ask across the... Um experiences. Open to any of the speakers to respond to. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, I, I will say that to to, uh, diff, to a varying degree, almost every big company has done some work in accessibility. Uh, Microsoft should not be in any way ignored because I think Microsoft has pioneered a lot of these things back in 1990s. Um, you know, so if you go to Microsoft.com/enable, you will see everything there is to know about Microsoft and accessibility. Including their accessibility guidelines, they have wonderful written user interface guidelines. BBC.co.uk, BBC in general is doing a really good job of accessibility. Um, IBM Research, uh, I forget what their website, I think it's ibm.com slash SNS or something like that. But if you search for IBM slash, you know, IBM accessibility, you're going to find it. So you can almost bet that almost every big company has done something in the field of accessibility. Um, it's just what they have done. It's something you probably have to research on. But certainly, I would say that in the industry, it's not uncommon for companies to, to um, think about it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Anyone else with a general question for one or more of the speakers? Well, while we're about to pull uh, our... Uh, Raffle winners, I did want to thank everybody for attending. Really enjoyed the evening. I want to thank all of our speakers. You were just awesome. I'm going to ask our speakers for um, references and copies of your deck so that we can post them up on our sites. And I'd also like to ask all of you to post reviews and feedback on the uh, PHP meetup and UPA, LA UPA meetup. Uh, tonight or tomorrow morning and let us know what you thought and spread the word for the upcoming events. I think it's really nice that we can all get together for this kind of networking and professional learning and just uh, great camaraderie. And thank you once again, uh, Joe, for pulling this all together. Thank you. Anyone missing a ticket?
Book or an ebook? Ebook, please. Ebook, please. Here you go. Thank Instant you. Instant winner. 75058. 08. Physical book or ebook? Ebook. Here you go. One more. One more. Two more. We have four physical books and then five uh, ebooks. 75053. 43? Yes, 43. Three. Woohoo! Yeah. Physical book or ebook? <laughs> I guess I'll take a physical book. Physical I don't know what to do with it exactly. Put, uh, <laughs> just put your. I uh, think I remember. Email address yeah. on the back. We'll connect it to that. Physical book or ebook? Next, 750539. 39. Woohoo! All right, physical book or ebook? Physical. Please. Physical. Put your email address on the back of the ticket. Do you need a pen? Uh, I don't have a pen. So, Captain, you gave out three physical, right? Three physical. So one, one more physical, physical one more ebook. Two more. 750507. Zero 07. Oh. You got it? Physical book or ebook? Uh, no, okay. Physical book. Grab your pen, write your email address on the back, and we'll get your address another mailing. Last one for the ebook. Last one, nice number. 75050. Zero, zero, zero. Zero, zero, five, zero, zero. All right. Woohoo! <laughs> Stick around at the end, you have good odds. All right, everybody. Joe, any closing thoughts? No, I mean, uh, I learned a lot, and uh, I hope that all of you did as well. Uh, keep following the, the GAD uh, uh, hashtag because I have a feeling we're going to do a lot more uh, uh, related to this before the next year comes around. Uh, something else I just uh, also neglected to mention at the beginning is that we also got a shout out from the Semantic Web community uh, because the Semantic Web community hadn't really taken the accessibility community that much into account. But um, basically, if we take uh, data and make it semantically, uh, tag it semantically, it will be good for both communities. So I'd like to just do a shout out to bring those two communities together and just follow the, the GAD hashtag and you're going to see more in a row on it you know, coming right up. And that's about it.